Taipei by Herman Melville. Chapter 10 How to obtain the fruit which we felt convinced must grow near at hand was our first thought. Taipei or Hapar, a frightful death at the hands of the fiercest of cannibals, or a kindly reception from a gentler race of savages. Which? But it was too late now to discuss a question which would so soon be answered. The part of the valley in which we found ourselves appeared to be altogether uninhabited. An almost impenetrable thicket extended from side to side, without presenting a single plant affording the nourishment we had confidently calculated upon. And with this object we followed the course of the stream, casting quick glances as we proceeded into the thick jungles on either hand. My companion, to whose solicitations I had yielded in descending into the valley, now that the step was taken, began to manifest a degree of caution I had little expected from him. He proposed that in the event of our finding an adequate supply of fruit, we should remain in this unfrequented portion of the valley, where we should run little chance of being surprised by its occupants, whoever they might be, until sufficiently recruited to resume our journey, when laying in a store of food equal to our wants we might easily regain the Bay of Nukahiva after the lapse of a sufficient interval to ensure the departure of our vessel. I objected strongly to this proposition, plausible as it was, as the difficulties of the route would be almost insurmountable, unacquainted as we were with the general bearings of the country, and I reminded my companion of the hardships which we had already encountered in our uncertain wanderings. In a word, I said that since we had deemed it advisable to enter the valley, we ought manfully to face the consequences, whatever they might be, the more especially as I was convinced there was no alternative left us but to fall in with the natives at once, and boldly risk the reception they might give us and that as to myself I felt the necessity of rest and shelter, and that until I had obtained them I should be wholly unable to encounter such sufferings as we had lately passed through. To the justice of these observations, Toby somewhat reluctantly assented. We were surprised that after moving as far as we had along the valley, we should still meet with the same impervious thickets and thinking that although the borders of the stream might be lined for some distance with them, yet beyond there might be more open ground, I requested Toby to keep a bright lookout upon one side, while I did the same on the other, in order to discover some opening in the bushes, and especially to watch for the slightest appearance of a path, or anything else that might indicate the vicinity of the islanders. What furtive and anxious glances we cast into those dim-looking shades! With what apprehensions we proceeded, ignorant at what moment we might be greeted by the javelin of some ambushed savage! At last my companion paused, and directed my attention to a narrow opening in the foliage. We struck into it, and it soon brought us by an indistinctly traced path to a comparatively clear space, at the further end of which we descried a number of the trees, the native name of which is Enui, and which bear a most delicious fruit. What a race! I, hobbling over the ground like some decrepit wretch, and Toby leaping forward like a greyhound. He quickly cleared one of the trees on which there were two or three of the fruit, but to our chagrin they proved to be much decayed, the rinds partly opened by the birds, and their hearts half devoured. However, we quickly dispatched them, and no ambrosia could have been more delicious. We looked about us uncertain whither to direct our steps, since the path we had so far followed appeared to be lost in the open space around us. At last we resolved to enter a grove near at hand, and had advanced a few rods when, just upon its skirts, I picked up a slender breadfruit shoot, perfectly green, and with the tender bark freshly stripped from it. It was still slippery with moisture, and appeared as if it had been but that moment thrown aside. I said nothing, but merely held it up to Toby, who started at this undeniable evidence of the vicinity of the savages, 
the plot was now thickening. A short distance further lay a little faggot of the same shoots bound together with a strip of bark. Could it have been thrown down by some solitary native, who, alarmed at seeing us, had hurried forward to carry the tidings of our approach to his countrymen, Taipee or Hapar? But it was too late to recede, so we moved on slowly, my companion in advance casting eager glances under the trees on either side, until all at once I saw him recoil as if stung by an adder. Sinking on his knee, he waved me off with one hand, while with the other he held aside some intervening leaves and gazed intently at some object. Disregarding his injunction, I quickly approached him and caught a glimpse of two figures partly hidden by the dense foliage. They were standing close together, and were perfectly motionless. They must have previously perceived us and withdrawn into the depths of the wood to elude our observation. My mind was at once made up. Dropping my staff, and tearing open the package of things we had brought from the ship, I unrolled the cotton cloth, and holding it in one hand, plucked with the other a twig from the bushes beside me, and telling Toby to follow my example, I broke through the covert and advanced, waving the branch in token of peace towards the shrinking forms before me. They were a boy and girl, slender and graceful, and completely naked, with the exception of a slight girdle of bark, from which depended at opposite points two of the russet leaves of the breadfruit tree. An arm of the boy, half screened from sight by her wild tresses, was thrown about the neck of the girl, while with the other he held one of her hands in his, and thus they stood together, their heads inclined forward, catching the faint noise we made in our progress and with one foot in advance, as if half inclined to fly from our presence. As we drew near, their alarm evidently increased. Apprehensive that they might fly from us altogether, I stopped short and motioned them to advance and receive the gift I extended towards them, but they would not. I then uttered a few words of their language with which I was acquainted, scarcely expecting that they would understand me but to show that we had not dropped from the clouds upon them. This appeared to give them a little confidence, so I approached nearer, presenting the cloth with one hand, and holding the bow with the other, while they slowly retreated. At last they suffered us to approach so near to them, that we were enabled to throw the cotton cloth across their shoulders, giving them to understand that it was theirs and by a variety of gestures endeavoring to make them understand that we entertained the highest possible regard for them. The frightened pair now stood still, whilst we endeavored to make them comprehend the nature of our wants. In doing this, Toby went through with a complete series of pantomimic illustrations, opening his mouth from ear to ear, and thrusting his fingers down his throat, gnashing his teeth and rolling his eyes about, till I verily believe the poor creatures took us for a couple of white cannibals who were about to make a meal of them. When, however, they understood us, they showed no inclination to relieve our wants. At this juncture, it began to rain violently, and we motioned them to lead us to some place of shelter. With this request, they appeared willing to comply, but nothing could evince more strongly the apprehension with which they regarded us than the way in which, whilst walking before us, they kept their eyes constantly turned back to watch every movement we made, and even our very looks. "'Taipee or Hapar, Toby?' asked I as we walked after them. "'Of course, Hapar,' he replied with a show of confidence, which was intended to disguise his doubts. "'We shall soon know,' I exclaimed." and at the same moment I stepped forward towards our guides, and pronouncing the two names interrogatively and pointing to the lowest part of the valley, endeavored to come to the point at once. They repeated the words after me again and again, but without giving any peculiar emphasis to either, so that I was completely at a loss to understand them. For a couple of wilier young things than we afterwards found them to have been on this particular occasion, 
never probably fell in any traveller's way. More and more curious to ascertain our fate, I now threw together in the form of a question the words Hapar and Mortarki, the latter being equivalent to the word good. The two natives interchanged glances of peculiar meaning with one another at this, and manifested no little surprise. But on the repetition of the question, after some consultation together, to the great joy of Toby, they answered in the affirmative. Toby was now in ecstasies, especially as the young savages continued to reiterate their answer with great energy, as though desirous of impressing us with the idea that being among the Hapars, we ought to consider ourselves perfectly secure. Although I had some lingering doubts, I feigned great delight with Toby at this announcement, while my companion broke out into a pantomimic abhorrence of Typee, and immeasurable love for the particular valley in which we were, our guides all the while gazing uneasily at one another as if at a loss to account for our conduct. They hurried on, and we followed them, until suddenly they set up a strange halloo, which was answered from beyond the grove through which we were passing, and the next moment we entered upon some open ground, at the extremity of which we descried a long, low, hut, and in front of it were several young girls. As soon as they perceived us, they fled with wild screams into the adjoining thickets, like so many startled fawns. A few moments after, the whole valley resounded with savage outcries, and the natives came running towards us from every direction. Had an army of invaders made an eruption into their territory, they could not have evinced greater excitement. We were soon completely encircled by a dense throng, and in their eager desire to behold us, they almost arrested our progress, an equal number surrounding our youthful guides, who with amazing volubility appeared to be detailing the circumstances which had attended their meeting with us. Every item of intelligence appeared to redouble the astonishment of the islanders, and they gazed at us with inquiring looks. At last we reached a large and handsome building of bamboos, and were by signs told to enter it, the natives opening a lane for us through which to pass. On entering without ceremony, we threw our exhausted frames upon the mats that covered the floor. In a moment the slight tenement was completely full of people, whilst those who were unable to obtain admittance gazed at us through its open canework. It was now evening, and by the dim light we could just discern the savage countenances around us, gleaming with wild curiosity and wonder, the naked forms and tattooed limbs of brawny warriors, with here and there the slighter figures of young girls, all engaged in a perfect storm of conversation, of which we were, of course, the one only theme, whilst our recent guides were fully occupied in answering the innumerable questions which every one put to them. Nothing can exceed the fierce gesticulation of these people when animated in conversation, and on this occasion they gave loose to all their natural vivacity, shouting and dancing about in a manner that well nigh intimidated us. Close to where we lay, squatting upon their haunches, were some eight or ten noble-looking chiefs, for such they subsequently proved to be, who, more reserved than the rest, regarded us with a fixed and stern attention, which not a little discomposed our equanimity. One of them in particular, who appeared to be the highest in rank, placed himself directly facing me, looking at me with a rigidity of aspect under which I absolutely quailed. He never once opened his lips, but maintained his severe expression of countenance, without turning his face aside for a single moment. Never before had I been subjected to so strange and steady a glance. It revealed nothing of the mind of the savage, but it appeared to be reading my own. After undergoing this scrutiny till I grew absolutely nervous, with a view of diverting it if possible, and conciliating the good opinion of the warrior, I took some tobacco from the bosom of my frock and offered it to him, 
he quietly rejected the proffered gift, and without speaking, motioned me to return it to its place. In my previous intercourse with the natives of Nukahiva and Tior, I had found that the present of a small piece of tobacco would have rendered any of them devoted to my service. Was this act of the chief a token of his enmity? Taipee or Hapar, I asked within myself. I started, for at the same moment this identical question was asked by the strange being before me. I turned to Toby. The flickering light of a native taper showed me his countenance pale with trepidation at this fatal question. I paused for a second, and I know not by what impulse it was that I answered, Taipee. The piece of dusky statuary nodded in approval, and then murmured, Mortarki? Mortarki, said I, without further hesitation. Taipee Mortarki. What a transition! The dark figures around us leaped to their feet, clapped their hands in transport, and shouted again and again the talismanic syllables, the utterance of which appeared to have settled everything. When this commotion had a little subsided, the principal chief squatted once more before me, and throwing himself into a sudden rage, poured forth a string of philippics, which I was at no loss to understand, from the frequent recurrence of the word hapar as being directed against the natives of the adjoining valley. In all these denunciations my companion and I acquiesced, while we extolled the character of the warlike Taipees. To be sure, our panegyrics were somewhat laconic, consisting in the repetition of that name, united with the potent adjective mortarki. But this was sufficient, and served to conciliate the goodwill of the natives, with whom our congeniality of sentiment on this point did more towards inspiring a friendly feeling than anything else that could have happened. At last, the wrath of the chief evaporated, and in a few moments he was as placid as ever. Laying his hand upon his breast, he now gave me to understand that his name was Mehavi, and that in return he wished me to communicate my appellation. I hesitated for an instant, thinking that it might be difficult for him to pronounce my real name, and then, with the most praiseworthy intentions, intimated that I was known as Tom, but I could not have made a worse selection. The chief could not master it. Tomo, Tama, Tommy, everything but plain Tom. As he persisted in garnishing the word with an additional syllable, I compromised the matter with him at the word Tomo, and by that name I went during the entire period of my stay in the valley. The same proceeding was gone through with Toby, whose mellifluous appellation was more easily caught. An exchange of names is equivalent to a ratification of goodwill and amity among these simple people, and as we were aware of this fact, we were delighted that it had taken place on the present occasion. Reclining upon our mats, we now held a kind of levy, giving audience to successive troops of the natives, who introduced themselves to us by pronouncing their respective names, and retired in high good humor on receiving ours in return. During the ceremony, the greatest merriment prevailed, nearly every announcement on the part of the islanders being followed by a fresh sally of gaiety, which induced me to believe that some of them at least were innocently diverting the company at our expense, by bestowing upon themselves a string of absurd titles of the humor of which we were of course entirely ignorant. All this occupied about an hour, when the throng, having a little diminished, I turned to Mahavi and gave him to understand that we were in need of food and sleep. Immediately the attentive chief addressed a few words to one of the crowd, who disappeared, and returned in a few moments with a calabash of poey poey, and two or three young coconuts stripped of their husks, and with their shells partly broken. We both of us forthwith placed one of these natural goblets to our lips, 
and drained it in a moment of the refreshing draught it contained. The poey poey was then placed before us, and even famished as I was, I paused to consider in what manner to convey it to my mouth. This staple article of food among the Marquise Islanders is manufactured from the produce of the breadfruit tree. It somewhat resembles in its plastic nature our bookbinder's paste, is of a yellow color, and somewhat tart to the taste. Such was the dish, the merits of which I was now eager to discuss. I eyed it wistfully for a moment, and then unable any longer to stand on ceremony, plunged my hand into the yielding mass, and to the boisterous mirth of the natives drew it forth laden with the poey poey, which adhered in lengthening strings to every finger. So stubborn was its consistency, that in conveying my heavily freighted hand to my mouth, the connecting links almost raised the calabash from the mats on which it had been placed. This display of awkwardness, in which, by the by, Toby kept me company, convulsed the bystanders with uncontrollable laughter. As soon as their merriment had somewhat subsided, Mahavy, motioning us to be attentive, dipped the forefinger of his right hand in the dish, and giving it a rapid and scientific twirl, drew it out, coated smoothly with the preparation. With a second peculiar flourish, he prevented the poey poey from dropping to the ground as he raised it to his mouth, into which the finger was inserted and drawn forth perfectly free from any adhesive matter. This performance was evidently intended for our instruction, so I again essayed the feat on the principles inculcated, but with very ill success. A starving man, however, little heeds conventional proprieties, especially on a South Sea island, and accordingly Toby and I partook of the dish after our own clumsy fashion, but plastering our faces all over with the glutinous compound, and daubing our hands nearly to the wrist. This kind of food is by no means disagreeable to the palate of a European, though at first the mode of eating it may be. For my own part, after the lapse of a few days, I became accustomed to its singular flavor, and grew remarkably fond of it. So much for the first course. Several other dishes followed it, some of which were positively delicious. We concluded our banquet by tossing off the contents of two more young coconuts, after which we regaled ourselves with the soothing fumes of tobacco, inhaled from a quaintly carved pipe which passed round the circle. During the repast, the natives eyed us with intense curiosity, observing our minutest motions, and appearing to discover abundant matter for comment in the most trifling occurrence. Their surprise mounted the highest when we began to remove our uncomfortable garments, which were saturated with rain. They scanned the whiteness of our limbs, and seemed utterly unable to account for the contrast they presented to the swarthy hue of our faces, embrowned from a six months' exposure to the scorching sun of the line. They felt our skin, much in the same way that a silk mercer would handle a remarkably fine piece of satin and some of them went so far in their investigation as to apply the olfactory organ. Their singular behavior almost led me to imagine that they never before had beheld a white man, but a few moments' reflection convinced me that this could not have been the case, and a more satisfactory reason for their conduct has since suggested itself to my mind. Deterred by the frightful stories related of its inhabitants, ships never entered this bay, while their hostile relations with the tribes in the adjoining valleys prevent the Taipees from visiting that section of the island where vessels occasionally lie. At long intervals, however, some intrepid captain will touch on the skirts of the bay, with two or three armed boats crews, and accompanied by an interpreter. The natives who live near the sea descry the strangers long before they reach their waters, and aware of the purpose for which they come, proclaim loudly the news of their approach. 
By a species of vocal telegraph, the intelligence reaches the inmost recesses of the veil in an inconceivably short space of time, drawing nearly its whole population down to the beach laden with every variety of fruit. The interpreter, who is invariably a tabooed kanaka, leaps ashore with the goods intended for barter, while the boats, with their oars shipped and every man on his thwart, lie just outside the surf, heading off from the shore, in readiness at the first untoward event to escape to the open sea. Footnote. The word kanaka is at the present day universally used in the South Seas by Europeans to designate the islanders. In the various dialects of the principal groups, it is simply a sexual designation applied to the males, but it is now used by the natives in their intercourse with foreigners in the same sense in which the latter employ it. A tabooed kanaka is an islander whose person has been made to a certain extent sacred by the operation of a singular custom hereafter to be explained. End of footnote. As soon as the traffic is concluded, one of the boats pulls in under cover of the muskets of the others, the fruit is quickly thrown into her, and the transient visitors precipitately retire from what they justly consider so dangerous a vicinity. The intercourse occurring with Europeans being so restricted, no wonder that the inhabitants of the valley manifested so much curiosity with regard to us appearing, as we did among them, under such singular circumstances. I have no doubt that we were the first white men who ever penetrated thus far back into their territories, or at least the first who had ever descended from the head of the veil. What had brought us thither must have appeared a complete mystery to them, and from our ignorance of the language it was impossible for us to enlighten them. In answer to inquiries which the eloquence of their gestures enabled us to comprehend, all that we could reply was that we had come from Nukahiva, a place, be it remembered, with which they were at open war. This intelligence appeared to affect them with the most lively emotions. Nukahiva Motarki? they asked. Of course, we replied most energetically in the negative. They then plied us with a thousand questions, of which we could understand nothing more than that they had reference to the recent movements of the French, against whom they seemed to cherish the most fierce hatred. So eager were they to obtain information on this point, that they still continued to propound their queries long after we had shown that we were utterly unable to answer them. Occasionally we caught some indistinct idea of their meaning, when we would endeavor by every method in our power to communicate the desired intelligence. At such times their gratification was boundless, and they would redouble their efforts to make us comprehend them more perfectly. But all in vain, and in the end they looked at us despairingly, as if we were the receptacles of invaluable information, but how to come at it they knew not. After a while the group around us gradually dispersed, and we were left about midnight, as we conjectured, with those who appeared to be permanent residents of the house. These individuals now provided us with fresh mats to lie upon, covered us with several folds of tapa, and then extinguishing the tapers that had been burning, threw themselves down beside us, and after a little desultory conversation, were soon sound asleep. 